today, this afternoon with Dean Ravel. About a year ago, Dean established his own business, Ravel Science, to provide a direct link between research and its application with landholders. He currently works on a project, Rangeland Self Herding, which he's speaking about today, supported by Rangelands NRM, and he also interacts with farmers and researchers and regional NRM groups on a range of activities with livestock production. Dean was previously a principal research scientist with CSIRO in Perth for nine years. Welcome, Dean. Thanks, Robin, and terrific to be here and to be hearing about so many interesting and great opportunities. And I hope I can add that, um, add to that today, talking to you about rangeland self-herding. It's a term that describes a very broad set of principles and practices, both, that's behaviour-based, that puts the manager of livestock in a position of positively influencing the, the, the behaviours of livestock, both in their location, their retention, their distribution, their movement, and indeed diet selection. I'm going to make use of the small amount of time I have with you to talk about some of the on-ground results that we've achieved over the last six to 12 months. And I hope not too frustratingly for you, not spending too much time on how it was achieved, but more than happy to talk to you uh, about that if you're interested. I want to start and finish with a pretty simple statement. Animals can change, simple but quite empowering. I probably don't need to convince you of that statement, but importantly is the next two components below it, that we can be active participants in that change and the change can occur quickly and cheaply and have long-lasting benefits for the livestock and the landscape and, and the business enterprise of, of the pastoral, pastoral business itself. Now, the sort of questions that we often hear, and I'm sure you either have or hear similar sorts of questions out there, relate to these sorts of things about why do animals seem to stay where they are even though there's good feed somewhere else? Can we distribute animals within a paddock to a new, to a new area? Um, can we diversify the diet of livestock? And it's these sorts of questions, and we're finding as we interact with pastoralists and putting it into practice a whole lot more that we can address with the principles and practices of rangeland self-herding. So one of the things that we need to, to, to begin with is the, the view that what we see now need not be the way it is of the future, but the behaviours of the past are shaping the here and now as well. So we've seen it either in our children or in our livestock, the behaviour that may not be quite as we wish, never tried it, don't like it. When I started my career in animal nutrition, I always thought that the, the key components that fed diet selection, which is something I'm really very interested in, is the choice you give animals at, 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 any, at any given point in time. They'll make a choice based on what you're offering. What they really do is make a choice based on what they've experienced in the past. So sure, they have to have it available to them to exercise that choice, but is the dominant factor in influencing diet selection and habitat selection is the experience that those animals have had in the past. And find the balance between the neophobia of grazing animals, the fear of the new, and the desire to seek variety puts the opportunity back on us as the managers to say, how can we broaden their experiences so a broader range of locations and plants in the landscape become familiar to them so that they don't end up in a situation represented by this cartoon here. So I'm going to quickly go through four examples and I'm going to skim across them with the time just to show you the sorts of what we think are pretty exciting results that landholders have achieved under their commercial pressures um, and time constraints. We visited a place in the Kimberley early in the project and shortly before we arrived to talk about the opportunities in, with rangeland self-herding, they were faced with a devastating fire. It was about 80% of the property that was impacted. So you can imagine they had their minds on a million things and we thought the last thing they want to do is talk to us about a new opportunity. But in fact, it turned out to be a very useful discussion to have because they had some pretty urgent decisions to make in, in that early recovery phase. And some of those early decisions involved um, these set of circumstances here where cattle had to be collected from different parts of the property, brought to the, to the yards and retained for a short period of time and decisions were made about some were sent for adjustment, some were sold and some were, were to be relocated to a relatively small part of the station that hadn't burnt onto a brand new bore that had never been used before. So no animals that they were placing there had any experience of that water point at all. 
And what was of paramount importance to them was that those animals used that location and remained in that location in the foreseeable future, didn't disperse back to their home ranges, which would be something we'd typically expect animals to do, not to disperse and put undue grazing pressure on on new growth that was already occurring post fire and certainly not to head east of the property where fences have been burnt and the risk of losing animals off property altogether. So a whole lot of time constrained but, but high pressure um, op, you know, challenges but an opportunity to see whether some of the principles we're talking about could indeed be put into practice. The green circle on the previous graph is, remains on here and the, the blue dots are about three weeks of grazing locations of two animals that were in the mob that was placed out there it was a mixed group that hadn't been as a single group before, mixed ages, mixed sex. The landholder used the, be the beautiful term of establishing a new colony. Um, and, and clearly you can see the location of those animals over that three year period was retained in the area uh, that they were desperate for that, for that result. And if we drill down a little more closely and look at the tracks of those animals now over about a four week period, so these had GPS collars, fitted to the animals, and there's two animals represented in this graph, one in the red and one in the blue line. The new boar that um, the animals were accessing is with the red arrow here, and you can see the grazing circuits that they established in a brand new location with a brand new group of animals and achieved this, this wonderful result. And as time um, progressed, and then some of the loops were getting bigger, and at about the three week mark, the blue cow decided to head back to her previous water point, which in itself is an intriguing result. But even more intriguing and perhaps understandable that she'd carved three days earlier before that move back to her home, her previous home, home range. But she had chosen to stay in the new location until she carved, and when the calf was strong enough in her mind to, to relocate, that's what she did. But some of the, the self-herding practices that they were implementing diminished in intensity because they had a million other jobs to do as well, so it was still a desirable result. They did report that all of the animals that they were seeing regularly in their visits were now using multiple water points, including the new one, which they were very happy about. Here's another example further south in the Pilbara um, in Western Australia. And this particular property has a long, narrow paddock uh, where the river is fenced off, which gives them a huge amount of flexibility in managing a key, the backbone of their property in terms of economic performance and also um, the landscape health as well. Despite it being a quite a narrow uh, paddock, there's the scale of four kilometres down in the bottom corner. As you can imagine, there's still patchiness within that. So along the river, it's getting a fair working over from a large number of cattle. But there was a, a patch here where a water point had been, and for six years they tailed cattle to that water point and held them there for a day, and then to find that they'd returned to the water the very next day. It was an area that was well abundant with feed, Roburn's Plains grass and other grasses. Um, were in high supply and re quite reasonable quality, but the cattle just didn't use it. It really was a case of never tried it, don't like it. So we, they implemented some pretty simple um, rangeland self-herding practices, and they're represented here in the comparison between the green line, which is the conventional management, they were taken to that water, but the animals returned back to use the, the river system. Whereas another group of cattle, and this is one animal uh, again with the GPS tracking collar representing that group, set up a brand new grazing circuit of, it, of their own. And the observation from the landholder was the group of cattle that were taken there behaved much more as a group than they had previously. So if we were to say, do cattle graze the river or not? I couldn't say, yes, they do or no, they don't. It depends on our management. It depends on the experience that we've provided those animals and what, what elements of familiarity we had offered those animals so that their new home became something they were comfortable to do. They were not held there. They had the choice to head back to the river, which was only a kilometre or two away. They chose to stay there and establish a new set of grazing circuits. A really encouraging and exciting result, I think. So the difference between management was the determining factor of the way the cattle were using that part of the landscape. A more ambitious program um, on another Pilbara property in a very large paddock, multiple land systems within that paddock, no invariable utilisation. The question is, could we influence grazing areas over time? So this is representation of that paddock and a known area of high utilisation down in the southwest corner. And what we were trying to do was to nudge, and I like that term that Fred Cheney used this morning, so I'm going to use it again, of nudging the behaviour of the cattle to head in a direction that was relatively underutilised. 
So here's the grazing distribution in the second half of October when the work was begun of, of, of five cattle with GPS collars. And the ellipse there is, is not me randomly drawing a circle, it's colleagues in CSIRO who have used the spatial analysis um, and the ellipsoid shows the direction and, and the, the scale of utilisation of the animals in the landscape. And that's what I'll use over these next series of three um, images. So in October when the work began, the area of high utilisation, and these are different water points. And as the months progressed with the implementation of strategies, which was using, as I'll explain a little bit more towards the end, of uh, familiarity and attractives, attractants and rewards, we were indeed nudging the movement of those cattle in the direction that we desired. At a property in the Gascoigne showed very early in the project something we're seeing very often in a range of places, that when these practices are implemented, the behaviour of the cattle and their relationship to the human changes drastically. And one of the perhaps early rewards for land management is that animals that used to only show a cloud of dust and a tail disappearing over the hill are now very comfortable to be in the presence of people, including strangers, which was us visiting this particular property. This is a clean-skinned bull that hadn't really been seen much before but was now very happy to be consuming water or, or the attractants that were placed in that area. High value to be able to opt to gather those animals with the price at the moment, but also think about mustering efficiency and the genetic implications if you can um, start collecting those animals and removing them from the landscape if that's your um, in something you'd like to do. Now, the principles behind it are in the paper and I don't have time to go through them, but we've condensed what we think is about 20 plus years of behavioural research and nutrition and physiology and ecological sciences into seven principles. And we use that when we sit down with landholders to say, how can we be having multiplier effects with what we're doing, the touch on the way we interact with animals, the feedback and experience animals gain, uh, the diet diversity, their capacity to change, individuals and groups of animals influencing each other. And being very mindful, particularly in light of the talks we just had, about broad consequences. If we change grazing distribution, we'll be changing all sorts of other things, vegetation, other herbivores, predators, fire risk, etc. And sometimes those other elements can be the key driver for why someone wants to make, make a change. So the last couple of slides are just to wrap up and, and um, hopefully whet your appetite to come and have a chat to me over the next few days. How do we do this? You know, how, it's not mystical and magical. How have they achieved the positive influence on animal um, lo location? It's about allowing animals to express individual choices, guiding their choices toward our goals, by cueing positive consequences and experiences with very clear signals and reinforcing those signals over time. We have a lot of strategies that we're developing. I'm not going to go through those, not only for time, but there's, it's a better thing to sit down with people individually. But it's not just one thing we're trying, it's to layer multiple approaches. And I'm finishing with a few photos to show you the how simple it can be that the cues that we're providing, which is giving very clear signals to animals where rewards are provided that attract them to an area rather than to distract them away from somewhere else. It can be whistles, clanging bells that they make. It can be CDs glinting in the sun, bird tape glinting. It can be very dilute molasses used as a, a smell and taste attractant, not as a supplement, but as an attractant. Tactile opportunities where on this attractant coat hanger, as we call it, is sound, polypipe that cattle love chewing on, chain, bits of pipe for them to make a noise and hang around, which in itself draws other cattle to that, or, or any livestock to that region. So collectively, we see a range of benefits to landholders and a range of benefits to landscapes. And the more we interact with pastoralists, the more we're being encouraged to think, to see that they're, they want to try these things for a a much greater range of reasons than we ever imagined, which puts us back to the opening statement that they can change, we can do it relatively quickly and cheaply, and we're sure it will have long-lasting effects on the business. Thank you.